Welcome to the Georgia Archives Virtual Lunch and Learn program. Today we're using Microsoft Teams webinar. I'm Penny Cliff, Education Specialist at the Georgia Archives. We're glad that you've joined us for our September presentation on Georgia politics by University of Georgia Professor of Political Science, Charles S. Bullock III. Dr. Bullock holds the Richard B. Russell Chair in Political Science and is Josiah Meeks Distinguished Teaching Professor and University Professor of Public and International Affairs at the University of Georgia. He has been at the University of Georgia since 1968, with the exception of two years when he was Professor of Political Science at the University of Houston. In 2005 and 2009, he was a Senior Fellow at Oxford University's Rothmere American Institute. In 2015, Dr. Bullock was named University Professor, an honor bestowed on faculty who have had a significant impact on the University of Georgia beyond academic responsibilities. The honor was first awarded in 1974, and no more than one University Professor can be named in any year. Now, if you have friends or family, who are unable to view this webinar, they can still enjoy this presentation as it will be uploaded to the Georgia Archives YouTube channel. You may ask Dr. Bullock any questions at the end of the presentation through the Q&A. I will read out the questions for Dr. Bullock to answer, or you can raise your hand and I will unmute you to ask any questions. Welcome, Dr. Bullock. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. Pleasure to uh, participate in this program today. Talk a bit about Georgia politics. Uh, Georgia politics have become far more interesting in recent years, uh, which for political scientists, that's great. <laughs> it gives me something to, to study and something my students to, uh, to, to also pursue. One of the first things in those of us who've been around Georgia any time at all, and I don't have to have been around Georgia for a particularly long time, recognize is that what we're seeing in Georgia now is it's not your father's politics, that things have changed and changed dramatically within a fairly short period of time. You know, one of the things that political scientists like to study is realignments. Well, Georgia has gone through one realignment from being a solidly democratic state to a very Republican state. And now we may be on our way to a second realignment. We may be moving back towards the Democratic Party, or at least that's the evidence we see. Now, the strength of the Republican Party has peaked uh, and things have begun to swing back towards towards the blue. We see here, this is the share of the vote won by the Republican and Democrat at the top of the ticket. That would be the president in presidential years and the governor in the midterm elections. So we go all the way back to 1998. We see blue is ahead of red. That was the year that Roy Barnes got elected. And until 2020, that was the last time that a non-incumbent Democrat had won statewide. So we went for about a generation with no new Democratic blood winning statewide. And we see there that in terms of the vote share, the high point for Republicans came in 2006, which was the year that uh, Sonny Perdue was, was reelected and he gets right at 60% of the vote. Uh, two years earlier, the reelection of George W. Bush uh, came close to 60% of the vote. And then after that, it stabilizes pretty much from 2010 with a gradual downward glide, uh, 2018, 2020, pretty much dead heat. And then that 2021 uh, runoff election, this, the figures there would be for the, uh, the warnock uh, Leffler contest. Yeah, we see that blue has opened up some space over red. Another way to look at this was just a single line, and this is the share of or the margin by which Republicans were winning or losing during this same period. So again, in 1998, it's below zero. So yeah, that was the year that Democrats won. Uh, in terms of the uh, size of the margin, the biggest one came in the Bush re-election in 2004, a little bit bigger than in the uh, re-election of Sonny Perdue in 2006. But what's really interesting here is we see it stabilizes from roughly 2008 to 2016, with Republicans winning the state by about 200,000 votes. Uh, come 2018, Stacey Abrams cuts mightily into that and eliminates about three-fourths, <coughs> excuse me, 
three fourths of the uh, of the, the Republican margin. So it goes down to about 55,000 votes. In a 2020 presidential election, as we know, is a margin for the Democrats of a little under 12,000. And then in 2021, back in January, uh, Raphael Warnock wins by about 93,000 votes. So quite a bit of change. Uh, and indeed, it's uh, not quite a straight line from the high point of 2004 down to 2021. But it is uh, overall a continuing period of decline. Now, during the 2020 presidential election, we saw something we really hadn't seen since at least, oh, 1996, one might even say 1992, and that is the two parties were interested in how Georgians were going to vote for president. We went through, say, about 20 years where candidates would come to Georgia along in the spring, they campaigned for our votes in the primaries, but once the spotlight moved on from Georgia after kind of an early March primary vote. We didn't see the candidates. They might go to Florida. Indeed, they did go to Florida quite a bit. They went to, to North Carolina. Other states were thought to be toss-up states, but they did not come back to Georgia. Or if they did, they would fly to the Atlanta airport. They'd motorcade downtown to a hotel, have a big fundraiser, raise lots of money, go back to the airport and leave. They would not get out and campaign in Georgia. But we saw that all change in 2020. During the fall of 2020, President Donald Trump came to Georgia four times. Indeed, he was in Rome just two days before the election, making a big pitch. Joe Biden came to Georgia within a week of the uh, presidential election. Uh, Kamala Harris was here on November 1, and Barack Obama was here on November 2. So we got to see the candidates and their families and their, their chief associates up close and personal. And that's something, as I say, we had not seen for, for about a generation. Uh, in the, the presidential vote, as I say, you know, it, it's very close. Uh, if you were following elections that night, uh, you know, Trump opens up a lead. He gets as big as about 300,000 votes. And then once they start counting the absentee ballots, it gets smaller and smaller. And then on that, I believe it was on Saturday after the election on, uh, on uh, Tuesday, Georgia was finally called in favor of, uh, of Joe Biden. Uh, in that election, uh, the, that even Purdue, who was seeking another term as governor, runs a bit ahead of Trump, runs about a thousand votes ahead of Trump. Well, once we get through the November election, uh, we, unlike any other state, continue to have campaigns. Now, any other state in the nation, once they finish counting the votes from November, now that was it, but not us. We had, as a political scientist, I love this, we literally became the center of the political universe because from early November until that January 5th, when we had the runoff for the Senate, we were the only game in town in terms of, of elections. And because of what was at stake with the control of the Senate, perhaps going to Democrats, if Democrats could somehow manage to win both of those Senate seats, I say something that no Democrat had been able to do to win as a non-incumbent since 1998, but if that could happen, then we would end up with the Senate we have now, which is di divided 50-50, and that's been critical for the pro programs that uh, President Biden had hoped to achieve. So, lots and lots of attention, even more advertising on television, the candidates coming to Georgia, uh, leading Democrats, leading Republicans campaigning in Georgia. Place was crawling with media. I talked to lots of media folks uh, with every election, but never like in this year, and never with the kind of range. I mean, not one, but four different Finnish journalists came to talk to me. Never talked to a Finnish journalist before in my life. Okay, so how is this playing out? If we look geographically, we'll take one, we'll take a kind of a before and after. So here's what it looked like in 2004. Concentrate right there in the Atlanta area. And what we see is only three Atlanta metro counties voted for the Democrat, for uh, John Kerry back in 2004. And the darkness of the color uh, indicates the indication of how big a margin. So we see that in DeKalb and uh, Clayton counties, yeah, it went pretty heavily for, uh, for, for Kerry. Fulton County, not so much, but only three counties there in Metro Atlanta. And then we see uh, the other urban counties, Chatham, uh, Bibb, uh, Clark, uh, Muskogee, Doherty, you know, they all voted Democratic, as we'd expect. But then if we fast forward to 2020, 
that's a lot bigger blue dot there around Atlanta. Indeed, there are nine counties there. And Atlanta began to see additional counties going before the Democrats with the uh, Obama election in 2008. He flipped three counties at that point. He flipped uh, Rockdale, Douglas, and uh, and uh, uh, Newton counties. And then Henry County flipped. And then in 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton carried both uh, Gwinnett and uh, and uh, Cobb County. We'll see some more of that. But this movement of urban Atlanta area, uh, pretty significant. Also make a, make a note here, if you look down and uh, kind of below the dot for Atlanta, a little bit to the left of that, you see a pink county. All right, that's Fayette County. And Fayette County is going to become a Democratic county sometime within the next 10 years. I don't know when, but it, it is moving in that direction. So that would make then a 10th county in Metro Atlanta, which is voting Democratic. But it was in rural Georgia, you know, everything north of uh, you know, Atlanta and, and uh, Athens, solid red. We look in South Georgia, we see this kind of necklace of blue counties across the middle of the state. OK, that's the old Black Belt area with very rich black soil, large numbers of African-Americans there. And that's why a number of those rural counties uh, were voting Democratic. But once we get below the Black Belt again, Pretty much nothing but red, except over in Savannah uh, or Chatham County and one of the suburban counties there. So what is it? Well, one way to, to think of it, <laughs> someone, I didn't think of this, but someone else did, went and calculated that if a county has a cracker barrel, chances are three out of four that it voted for Donald Trump. If a county has a Whole Foods, odds are about five out of six that it probably voted for Joe Biden. So. Part of what's been happening is urbanization become an increasing factor. And sure enough, both Biden and Warnock rule the roost when it comes to urban counties, get around two thirds of the votes there. But once we get to the rural counties, it's just the opposite. You know, there, Donald Trump, uh, Kelly Leffler, Senator Perdue uh, win those counties by margins of two to one. And the suburban counties, yeah, they're the toss-ups. They're the toss-ups. So as closer a suburban county is to an urban center, more likely it's blue as you move out to kind of another ring further and further out. Then you tend to see more Republicans up there. So what's happening? Well, people are moving to urban areas. Georgia is a growth state. We added over a million people during the from 2010 to 2020. The people are moving to Georgia overall. Not every one of them, but overall, tend to be more progressive than the folks who are already here. Uh, these new folks are moving from California because they want to get away from floods and fire. They're moving down from New England, from Pennsylvania, from New York, because they want to move to a place where they can play tennis, golf, jog year round. And these people, as I say, they're bringing their partisanship with them. And then overall, they tend to be more liberal, more likely to be Democrats than the folks who are here. And something else happens. As these uh, urbanites move into, or these folks, these uh, northerners, westerners move into urban Georgia, people with whom they interact, the folks who are already there, well, some of that uh, more liberal approach to politics rubs off on the folks who are already here. So that also influences the, the growing tendency we see for Democrats to do well. Now, what's happening out in rural Georgia where most of those counties, we'll see this much later on another slide, most of those counties are not growing. You know, they're losing population. Uh, they may be losing their hospital. They may lose their school. Uh, you know, things which the folks who are staying there are unhappy with. What do those people do? You know, they're unhappy. They're, things are getting away from their, their, their way of life is changing in you know, substantial ways. What do they do? Well, they look for support. They look for help. They turn to the dominant party, the Republican Party. So the rural Georgia becomes even more Republican as urban Georgia becomes Democratic. And then also another part of it too is that uh, some of the particularly young people who grow up in rural Georgia, they go off to college or they simply go and look for a job. They, as they move to urban Georgia, they may also then change their, their preferences, begin to vote differently than what their parents did. So if we look at uh, where the Democrats do really well, so kind of zeroing in on some of those blue counties we just saw on the previous slide. Okay, these are the big four counties. These are the counties which give Democrats their biggest margins. 
We see that in every one of those counties, Biden ran ahead of Clinton, you know, does 50,000 votes better than Clinton in DeKalb, 70,000 votes better than, than she did in Fulton. And you also notice that the percentage of the votes won by Biden exceeds that for Clinton four years earlier. Cobb County, yeah, Clinton carried that with 49%. She won a plurality, she didn't get a majority there. You know, there was a libertarian candidate. But by 2020, yeah, that's 56% Democratic. Kind of a rule of thumb that's often used by journalists and political scientists is anything about 55% is a landslide. So it goes from being a very marginal toss-up county in 2016 to a landslide Democratic county four years later. If you look at the difference in the margins by which Biden uh, won compared to Clinton's victories in these counties, it comes to about 229,000 votes. Four years earlier, uh, the state went for Donald Trump by 212,000 votes. So this difference, this Biden performance above what Clinton was able to do, uh, essentially wiped out Trump's advantage there. If we look, uh, just kind of comparing 2020 with uh, January 2021, we see that uh, Warnock's margins, his percentages go up uh, in each county except for Fulton where he holds the same percentage. Now he has smaller numbers of votes because there was a drop off in about half a million voters uh, in terms of the total turnout in that, uh, Janu Ju in that uh, November election compared with the January election. Now, moving on and looking at the counties which gave Republicans their biggest margins, not in terms of percentage of the votes, but in terms of numbers of votes, we see counties which are on kind of the second or maybe third tier out from Atlanta. Cherokee, Forsyth, Hall on the north side, Coweta on the uh, southwest side. Okay, now again, the, the margins by which Trump is winning those are much, much smaller than the margin by which Democrats are winning the big four. Uh, what's particularly interesting, I think, here is if we look at the percentages of the margins, Trump wins those counties handily. You know, they all would be bright red, but his percent of the vote declines in each of the four counties. You know, drops off by four percentage points in, uh, in Cherokee, by six percentage points in Forsyth. And Forsyth is particularly interesting and that not only does the percent of the votes won by Trump decline, but the actual size of his margin declines. He carried that county by 46,000 votes in 2016. He wins it by only 43,000 votes four years later. So what do we see? We see in the major Democratic counties, Democrats are rolling up even larger numbers. And we see in the, uh, the major Republican counties, yes, they're winning them handily, but by by smaller percentages. So the Democrats are actually making some gains out in these solidly Republican counties. Uh, if we compare Trump with Purdue, so November with, with January, uh, Purdue runs a bit ahead of, of Trump, you know, about a percentage point or so in each of these counties. So changes showing up here and where the, where the votes are, where uh, the, the biggest margins are. But Purdue, you know, he was running for re-election. So we've got another baseline here. We can compare his performance in 2020 with how he did six years earlier. Six years earlier, not a question, no staying up late at night. Yeah, Purdue gets elected pretty handily. But here we see, if we compare this, I'm sure this is just kind of selected counties, but what we see is that in every one of these counties, these are all Metro Atlanta counties, he's losing ground. You know, his per share of the vote in Cherokee goes down by about six points. In Cobb County, it goes from a, barely a landslide in favor of him in 2014 to a landslide in favor of John Ossoff four years later. Loss of seven points there in Fayette, the county which I said is going to be turning blue at some point during the next decade. Uh, loss of you know, even more in Forsyth, you know, which went you know, 80% for him back in 2014. He gets about two thirds of the vote 2020. And Henry County, which was very much of a toss-up county in, uh, in 2014, it's solidly uh, Democratic uh, four years later. And Gwinnett, again, you know, comfortably for, for Purdue in 2014, but four years later, he, you know, he struggles to even get it 40%. So change is coming and we see it uh, kind of around the urban areas. Now, the rural areas, now we wouldn't see things like this. We see Demo Republicans still winning and winning pretty handily. So, uh, 
why has Georgia become a swing state, which we weren't for years, but clearly we are now. We will be in 2024, probably 2028. Well, I said we had a million new people move in here. Lots of new voters got signed up. And these voters who signed up, two-thirds of them were minorities, and about half were under 35. As we will see, these are the kinds of groups that tend to be Democratic. So that kind of change is, is coming about. Uh, overall, one way to kind of summarize this would be to look at what share of the votes were cast by whites. Because of major ethnic groups, the white vote is the only one that is solidly Republican. Now, the black vote is very solidly uh, Democratic. Asian voters, uh, Hispanic voters, uh, they're not nearly as Democratic as African-American voters, but Asians and uh, Hispanics probably around somewhere in the 60% range, 60, 65, 67% uh, from election to election. So let's see what has happened with regard to the share of the vote coming from white voters. How has that changed? We're going to go back to 1996 and between 77 and 78% of all votes cast in Georgia were cast by whites. And it stays up around 75% on into the new century, up to about 2002. 2004, it drops down, but still it's above 70% as it is in 2006. And then from that point, it goes on down, down. So what we've seen in the last rounds of elections, 2018, 20, and then uh, the January 2021, is that fewer than, or less than 60% of the votes in Georgia are coming from whites. Uh, one little kind of footnote here is that these figures are the ones calculated using the turnout data reported by the Secretary of State's office. Georgia has terms of trying to figure out race and ethnicity of registrants and voters. Georgia's data are better than almost any other state. You know, when you registered to vote, you know, you, you checked the box in terms of your race or ethnicity. Or most people did anyway. But what is happening is there are a growing number of folks who are not checking a box or checking other. And so this 58 percent, a little under 60 percent of the vote from whites uh, recently is a, probably a bit of an underestimate. One of my colleagues here has tried to go and figure out of those who didn't check, you know, who checked other or just didn't check anything at all, what share of that vote was from whites. His best guesstimate is probably it's around still around 63%. But whether it's 63 or 60 or 58, it is far, far less share of the vote that's coming from whites now than it was again a generation ago, back in the late 90s, back in the early, early 2000s. So we've seen quite a change which has taken place here. Okay, so what about age groups? I mentioned the other two. A lot of the new voters are young, under 35. Does age make a difference? Well, yeah, of course it does. Uh, the strongest Democrats, whether we look at the presidential election or we look at the Senate runoff, are the younger voters. And this has been true going back at least to 2014. Going back to 2014, the under 30s have been consistently Democratic. Of course, one of the implications of this is potentially that if these younger voters, as they age, if they continue to be as Democratic, you know, that's good news for Democrats, bad news for Republicans. For Republicans, where do they do best? Well, it's the opposite end of the age continuum. So the retirees, yeah, solidly, solidly Republican. But one way to almost look at this is that we have what's called generational change taking place. So, yeah, this may be a bit of hyperbole, but what we might say is that you know, Republicans are dying and their grandchildren are voting for the Democrats. And again, we see you know, the youngest voters solidly Democratic, even the voters up through you know, 45. You know, so voters who've got probably kids in middle school, kids in high school, yeah, they're also solidly Democratic. So one of the manifestations of where the, where the change is coming from is coming from the, the younger voters uh, who are voting quite differently than their parents. And as I say, if they continue to do that as they age, yeah, well, that's, um, that'll work well for the Democrats. Now, of course, before we, we make that kind of a firm conclusion, we all remember what Winston Churchill said. And he said that uh, if when you're young, you're not a liberal, then you have no heart. 
But if when you're old, you're not conservative, you have no brain. So they may change. They may become more conservative as they age. You have to wait and see. Uh, for Democrats to win in Georgia, they need what is sometimes referred to as a 30-30 election. That means they need to get 30% of the white vote. I don't need to get a majority, but 30% of the white vote will suffice if, along with that, African Americans cast at least 30% of all votes. So get 30% of the white share and have blacks cast 30% overall, with the Democrat probably getting somewhere in the neighborhood of 90% of that, that black vote. Well, how has that played out? Well, Hillary Clinton, who did not come that close to winning Georgia, got only 21% of the white vote. Stacey Abrams, who did come fairly close, but lost Georgia, and she got about 24% of the white vote. Now, the exit polls, which were done this year, well, last year, actually, November, and then in, in January, estimated that African Americans were casting 30% of the vote. So it was hitting that first target, 30% of the blacks to cast 30% of the vote. And the estimates also were that uh, about 29% of the white votes were going for, for Biden, for example. So that... Uh, Biden wins very narrowly, wins by 12,000 votes, and he's barely hitting the marks that are necessary for a Democrat to win. You know, getting the blacks casting right at 30% of the vote and, uh, and getting about 30% of the white vote. Oh, uh, here are the, these are exit poll figures here. We see that both for Biden and Warnock, white women are a little bit more likely to vote Democratic than white men, but you know, white voters very, very solidly still on the Republican side. Among black voters, yeah, uh, it's a bit of a difference here, particularly in the presidential election. And uh, President Trump made a play for, and uh, Republicans were pleased that they did somewhat better with black men in uh, 2020 than they've done in the past. So a 10 percentage point difference there. That narrows down to four points when the Democratic candidate is an African American, in the case of Reverend Warnock. But what focus people really focused on have been uh, college educated whites. And here we see that, yeah, even the college-educated whites are still a predominantly Republican group, but they're kind of moving in that toss-up range. Now, I don't have the figures here, but if we were to go back and look at how white women, college-educated women, voted four years ago, uh, Hillary Clinton did not do nearly as well as Biden or Warner. She gets about 34% of the vote from white college-educated women. And among white college-educated men, they... they turned their backs on her. You know, Clinton got about 21% of their votes, where we see that Joe Biden almost doubles that figure, up to 40%. So this role of the, the votes cast by white college-educated uh, uh, voters, tremendously important in the ability for Democrats, if they're going to be able to win in Georgia, yeah, they have to have good turnout among minorities, but they also have to run very well among the white college-educated. Now, the group that is the core constituency for the Republican Party, by core constituency, that means that group which is the most reliable, most solidly Republican. That would be white evangelicals or white born again. We see that in both 2016 and 2020, white evangelicals go overwhelmingly for Trump. They go very strongly for Purdue in uh, 2020. Uh, there is some erosion in Trump's support from this group. It goes from 92% in uh, 2016 down to 85% in 2020. There's also a drop-off in the share of the votes cast in November from evangelicals. Now, maybe that may be a statistical blip. You know, it's, statistically, uh, that would be essentially the same. You know, it's not a statistical difference between that. But also, it's just interesting about these figures. As you look at those figures, 30 through 4, 32%, and 85, <coughs> excuse me, it's basically the 92% for Trump in 2016. And what this tells us is that uh, white evangelicals account for a larger share of the electorate than do African Americans. And African Americans are not 34% or even 32% of the overall electorate. They're coming close, but they're not that. Their level of, uh, of, uh, of uh, unity is about the same, uh, somewhere around 90 percent. 
but there are actually more white evangelicals in Georgia probably than there are African Americans. So Republicans do have uh, have a strong uh, base on which to to build, and from which they do indeed build. Now the Trump factor, how does it play out? Well, Trump certainly is significant in turning out a share of the Republican vote. Uh, and Republican candidates uh, pledge their, their loyalty pretty much to, to the president, the former president. They know he's going to be important. Uh, there are some, it's a smaller group, share of Republicans who are, are non-Trumpers. And for them, yeah, he is not a factor, but for the great bulk of the Republican Party, he is a major factor. But here's what's really interesting, is that Trump, not only does he mobilize Republicans, he also mobilizes Democrats. Been told, I have been told by people on the inside of uh, Democratic senatorial campaigns that when Trump came to Georgia each of those times, their numbers, the Democrats' numbers, and their tracking polls jump. Now, tracking polls are fairly small samplings that are done each night and then over you kind of have like a running average so that over several nights you combine them and you can see what's happening and so that when Trump would come to Georgia and have a rally yeah he would even inspire tens of thousands of his followers to go to the rally but overall he would also cause the number of individuals who said they were inclined to vote for the Democrat to go up a uh, good friend of mine Republican consultant has said publicly that the number crunchers are a number cruncher on the Republican side has calculated that for each additional vote that Trump mobilized to go to the polls, he mobilized somewhere between 1.1 and 1.2 Democrats to show up who might not have otherwise showed up. So as I say, Trump works for both sides. He, he turns out Republicans. He also turns out Democrats. Uh, in the particularly as we look towards the runoff and all the emphasis was put on that democrats were united republicans were somewhat divided and by that what i mean is there were some republicans uh particularly lynn wood and sydney powell who were telling republicans don't vote in the runoff and the rationale was that leffler and purdue had not done enough for donald trump they had not uh, you know, helped him with his claim that, uh, that the Georgia election would have been stolen. Uh, and then also it did help Republicans that Trump was saying that Georgia's election system was not to be trust, trusted. I mean, he said, you know, the elections were rigged in Georgia. And so the thought is that some share of potential Republican voters believe that and said, well, if Donald Trump says like, can't trust the election system, why, why bother to go and vote? Now, the other element is Trump also was very critical of absentee voting. Even as the Republican Party of Georgia was sending out you know, messages encouraging Republicans to vote absentee, Trump was saying, oh, don't do that. Don't trust that. It's not reliable. And so what happened was that Democrats dominated the early voting period. They ran up big numbers in terms of people who voted early absentee so the republicans were left hoping that uh in january on five on election day that they would be able to catch up by having enough republicans go to the polls on that that day to overtake the big lead the democrats had built up well republicans did outvote democrats on election day but the democratic lead was was too big you know republicans could not catch up with them. So what do we got? Is Georgia a red state, a blue state, a purple state? Well, I don't think it's certainly not as red as it used to be. I don't think it's a blue state. Uh, purple, maybe pink, I don't know, but it's something other than that. So evidence that Georgia remains a remains at the larger party. Well, there are a number of pieces of evidence of that. If we look at the statewide vote for the congressional candidates, Republicans take a small majority there, 51% of, of the vote there. If we look at voting for public service commission candidates, now this is a, a contest, or those are contests, that political scientists like to look at and say, this maybe gives us a pretty good notion of what the 
baseline support among the parties is because you know, for presidency, yeah, you, you may vote your party, but some Sierra voters are going to vote against their party because they like the candidate of the other side or they dislike their candidate's nominee. But when it comes to PSC contests, I mean, those are not highly publicized. Uh, the candidates don't spend tons of money on television ads. And so an awful lot of voters, when they've gone to the polls, they wanted to vote for president or governor or senator. They're working their way down the ballot. They get to PSC and they're kind of scratching their heads because they don't know anything about these candidates. But if you're a partisan, you get to that situation where you don't know about the candidates. What do you do? Well, you probably fall back on your party and say, well, I'll make the assumption that my party nominee is better than the other party's nominee. So this may give us a much better notion of the strength of the parties. And what we've seen over the last couple of election cycles is that the Republicans running for the PSC are getting right at 50% of the vote. The Democrats are getting right at 48% of the vote. It's the other two, 3% uh, goes for the Libertarians. So that would again suggest that Republicans have a narrow overall margin right now. If we look at the vote for state house and state senate, again, the overall total vote uh, for the state for the state house shows Republicans winning about 52% of those votes, about 54% in the state Senate. So Republicans have managed to maintain their leads in the congressional delegation. They did lose a seat this year, the Bordeaux seat in the 7th District, but still about an 8-6, not about, it is an 8-6 majority. Democrats had some hopes of flipping the state house. They need 16 seats to do that, but they picked up only three seats. And then they lost one, uh, the Democratic leader, Bob Trammell down in Luthersville got defeated, so Democrats have only a net gain of two seats in 2020, and they flipped one Senate seat. So, yeah, the bulk of the votes for these kinds of positions uh, continue to be, re be Republican, and uh, Republicans continue to hold on to, to slight margins with regard to these positions. Uh, we look to Midterm elections. Generally, in midterm elections, these are bad for the president's party. Uh, and so based on that, and this, there have rarely been exceptions where, at least nationwide, the opposition party, the party that doesn't control the White House, almost always picks up seats in the midterm election in the U.S. House. But the size of the gains made by the opposition party are very closely linked to how many seats the president's party picked up in the presidential year. Well, in 2020, Democrats didn't pick up seats nationwide. Indeed, the only seat in which they made a gain in something that had been redrawn in the entire nation was Georgia 7. You know, Democrats did pick up two seats in North Carolina, but those were newly drawn districts. So the rest of the nation, in Districts that hadn't been redrawn, Democrats win one, Republicans make you know, double-digit gains. So that kind of goes against this, this normal trend. Now, another normal trend for a midterm election is that Democrats don't turn out in as good in numbers as Republicans do. Everybody gets excited about the presidential elections, but come the midterm elections, Republicans do a better job of getting their voters back to the polls than Democrats. But again, we may see something of exception here, and that would be particularly Georgia, where in 2018, which was also a midterm election, we set a record for turnout. And a large part of this was the very effective mobilization that Democrats had in getting their voters back to the polls. So that'll be a challenge for Democrats in 2022 to see if they can be as effective in getting their folks to show up again for the midterms as they were in uh, 2018. Now, thanks to the registration rules in Georgia, the main element here is when you get or renew your driver's license, we have an opt-out system for registration. That is, you will be registered unless you say, oh, no, 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 I don't want to participate. So there are relatively few Georgians now who are not, who are of age and citizens who are not registered. And indeed, a chunk of those who are not registered who would you know, have the age uh, standard to be so are folks who have not yet completed their uh, sentence of uh, sentence parole things like this so we look to 2022 
one of the things we want to keep an eye on is whether there will be a Trump ticket in Georgia. Former president has now made an endorsement of Herschel Walker for the Senate. Uh, he has endorsed Burt Jones for lieutenant governor, and he's endorsed Jody Heiss for secretary of state. Now, if those three all get their party's nominations and are on the ticket uh, in November of 2022, yeah, there'll be something of a Trump ticket. Will Trump come to Georgia and campaign for them, as he did for Leffler and for uh, Purdue? If he does, will it have the same effect as in 2020? That is, yeah, it will inspire some Republicans, but will it also have the impact of inspiring some Democrats to turn out to vote against him? Uh, so again, those are things which you know, we, we look forward, we can kind of scratch our heads and, and wonder about. Of course, one of the other things that's gonna change in 2022 for our congressional districts and our state legislative districts is we're, we're gonna be running in new districts. So some folks are gonna find that the incumbent who they voted for for years can't do it now because they're no longer in that district, particularly in say around urban areas where districts are overpopulated. You may not move, but your district line may move and therefore you're not gonna be voting for the same person that you have in the past. The state held, the, excuse me, the redistricting committees held a number of hearings around Georgia and people, the hearings said they want the process to be open which it probably won't be, and that's not something that's not enough on, Dem on Republicans because when Democrats were the more majority, they didn't hold open, um, they did not draw the, the maps, excuse me, kind of out in the open. So the maps will be drawn by technicians and then they'll be presented. Uh, one of the other requests that a lot of people made when they showed up these hearings, they wanted fairness. Well, that probably would be Democrats saying that, and they probably were talking about something like proportional representation, but our system is not set up for that. If you want proportional representation, you need to have a system like in Europe, where you have multiple multi-member districts, and then within those multi-member districts, you apportion out the seats in rough proportion to the share of the vote. But we don't do that. We have single member districts. Now the slide that's still up here, you see Republicans having slight majorities. In our system with its single member districts, almost always the party which is a majority gets a bonus of several percentage points. That's precisely what we see happening here in Georgia right now. Democrats took advantage of that also back when they were the majority. Uh, in drawing the plan, oh, and also uh, Republicans have what's called a trifecta. That is, you know, there are three potential players in Georgia when it comes to redistricting. There is a state house which will draw districts, the state senate will draw districts. Once they work out any disagreements and it goes to the governor, and the governor can veto it because it's just a piece of legislation or anything else. Well, Republicans control all these, so they have a trifecta. So they will end up with plans which are gonna be advantageous to them, no doubt about it. But in drawing those districts, a challenge is that the party drawing the districts isn't just looking at the next election or the next two elections, they're actually trying to figure out how do we draw plans that are gonna work for us for 10 years? Well, the plans that Republicans drew back in 2011 worked out for them pretty well through 2012, 14, 16. But in 2018, they started losing. They lost a congressional seat. They lost 14 U.S. House, state house seats and a couple of Senate seats. So that's also part of the challenge. As you think about this, or as Republicans think about this, are they going to look at some of those marginal districts, particularly in, uh, around Atlanta, especially on the north side, and say, we can't defend all of the Republicans we have right now. We need to, have to take a fallback position, maybe try to defend fewer of those. Also, uh, as they think about this, as Democrats think about it, Democrats suffer from what is sometimes called a natural gerrymander. Okay, what does this map show us? Well, this shows us if it's green at all and any coloration of green, that's a county that gained population between 2010 and 2020. If it's any color of orange, it lost. And again, the deeper the shade, the bigger the loss. So yeah, urban area, metro Atlanta, growth counties, indeed the, the biggest county, the county with the most growth, uh, is Forsyth County up there, it's the biggest grower. But to get kind of south of the fall line, it's more more losses and gains. And that's true nationwide. There are more counties in the U.S. that lost population over the last 10 years and gained population. So what's gonna happen? Well, South Georgia is gonna continue the trend of the last 60 years, and some of its districts are gonna, state house, state senate districts, are gonna migrate up to Metro Atlanta. You know, 
Forsyth County. Certainly going to pick up a house seat, maybe more than that, maybe gets a new Senate seat. So that'd be that kind of kind of shift that goes on. But the problems with Democrats, again, going back to those earlier slides where we saw how big Democrats were winning in Fulton and DeKalb and uh, Clayton County, things like this. Uh, they have, they're going to continue to win those districts overwhelmingly for the state legislature, where Republicans are going to be in a position where they're going to win a number of districts uh, by very, by relatively marge, small margins. And part of that, I say, there's just nothing you can do about that because of that concentration of Democrats, the way they are, where they, where they live, how that, that works out. So Republicans go into redistricting, they get to draw the maps, so they have this advantage in terms of the natural gerrymander, and they will probably come up with maps that will work for them, certainly in 2022, maybe 2024. And then depending on how how well they can see over the next couple of hills and around the corners in terms of anticipating how populations are going to shift, greater growth in urban areas, those things, you know, they, they may or may not be able to hold on to the legislature, hold on to the congressional district majority that they are going into this process with. When it comes, of course, to statewide offices, governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, attorney general, senator, yeah, those aren't districted. And therefore, it's straight up, you know, who has the votes in terms of who can win. And what we're going to see through this next decade is that these are going to be hard fought con contests to see who carries George in the presidential election, whether a Democrat or Republican can win the governorship and other statewide positions. So if you're interested in politics, this is going to be an exciting time. If you hate seeing political ads, life's going to be bad for you because, you know, in the even numbered years, you know, along in the autumn, it's going to be, you know, the same, maybe not as the, quite the intensity of advertising we saw in fall of 2020 and then on into November and December of, of 2020, but you're going to see an awful lot more ads than you were used to seeing, say, 10 years ago. Uh, there's nothing, nothing else about that. Okay, well, let me stop at this point, see if we've got any questions. Uh, or people want to just you know, continue eating their lunches and go about their day, whatever. Well, Dr. Bullock, while we're waiting for um, some questions, you can type them in the chat or you can raise, raise your hand. Um, I have a few questions here. Um, you mentioned like if you do or don't like political ads, do you think that negative political ads are beneficial or they actually hurt the candidate? Yeah, yeah. People say they hate negative ads, but billions of dollars. And in Georgia, during the last you know, 18 months or so, literally tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars were spent mainly on negative ads. So politicians, the candidates, the candidates, managers, they think they work. Why do they think they work? Well, uh, Hate is a stronger emotion than love. People are more likely to remember a negative ad than a positive ad. So yeah, people say they don't like them, but they're effective. And therefore, you know, we will continue to, to see those kinds of attacks. What's really changed though, is that increasingly the attack ads are not paid for by the candidates. They're paid for by political action committees and these super PACs which don't have to report who is giving them money are the ones who run the negative ads. So often it'll be the candidate will run the positive ads. And you think back to the kind of ads that Reverend Warnock ran with his, with his puppy or with his Christmas tree lights. Yeah, those he paid for, his campaign paid for. Uh, ads attacking uh, his opponent, probably paid for by a super PAC. Okay, thank you. Um, while we're still waiting, let's see. Why do you think that Hillary Clinton did not do as well with white college educated men and women? Well, she wasn't as good a candidate. She did not run a particularly good campaign. Uh, you know, hers, <laughs> hers was a, a campaign to, to lose, her election to lose, and she managed to do so. So, yeah, it was uh, not a well run campaign with a not particularly attractive candidate. Um, Another question. Um, you mentioned that there was a declining share of votes by whites um, from a generation ago. What do you attribute that to? Well, that's our growing diversity. Uh, you know, our 
population, particularly uh, Hispanics, is growing dramatically. Hispanics now are more than 10% of the entire population of Georgia. Uh, we have growing numbers of, of Asians. The black population is growing slightly, but black registration numbers are up. And, uh, this is what Hillary Clinton, excuse me, not Hillary Clinton, uh, Stacey Abrams spent an awful lot of time working on, was trying to mobilize minorities, get them, get them registered to vote, and then encourage them to turn out. And, uh, so, yeah, that uh, this change in the racial ethnic makeup of the electorate uh, is showing that her efforts have, have been succeeding. Right. You see, we don't have any more questions, but we have a thank you for the presentation. And um, Dr. Bullock, we really, really thank you for a fascinating, timely presentation on Georgia politics. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for jo thank you for joining us. Um, well, um, please join us for our fourth Friday from the archives on September the 24th for a presentation by archivist Amanda Moroz. Um, Amanda's presentation will be a new collection at the Georgia Archives, the Downtown Development Design Assistance Materials. The collection includes the Georgia Downtown Main Street Program which began in 1980. Towns and cities from all across Georgia took advantage of this program. Thrown in with a short history of town development in Georgia, come and see a sample of plans and maps and documents and photographs housed in this collection. And once again, thank you, Dr. Bullock, and thank you everyone for joining us on this webinar. And hopefully we will see you at later this month.